How can we support neurodivergent children to navigate the journey of executive functioning skills? That's what we're going to explore in this week's episode of Pookie Ponders. So let's dive straight in. So today's episode is all about executive functioning skills, what they are, why neurodivergent children might struggle with them, and what we can do to support at school and at home. And a little bit of me getting on my soapbox and wondering why it all matters so much, because our kids are brilliant just as they are. So buckle up. It's a lot, but I hope you find it interesting, informative, and perhaps maybe even a little bit inspiring. So to start with, What are executive functioning skills? It's a term we hear bandied about all the time. So executive functioning skills encompass a range of mental abilities that are crucial for everyday tasks. They include things like planning, organization, time management, and emotional regulation. And understanding these skills is kind of fundamental to supporting our children and young people in navigating their daily lives. And things we can do to kind of help ourselves understand it better would be to I don't know, like initiate a a simple self-reflection exercise. So identify your own executive functioning strengths and weaknesses. So thinking about your own ability to plan, organise, time manage and emotionally regulate. Where are your strengths and challenges there? That self-awareness as a first step can just help you begin to relate better to the challenges of the children and young people in your care and think about the, the, the difficulties that might be faced by neurodivergent children who perhaps struggle a bit more with these things in particular. So next, who tends to struggle with these skills and and what does that actually look like in practice? So individuals who are neurodivergent, who may be autistic, dyslexic, dyspraxic, ADHD, etc., like under that massive umbrella of many neurodivergences, um, may face challenges with their executive functioning to varying degrees and to varying degrees between individuals and also within individuals. An individual on different days at different times may struggle differently with their executive functioning skills. But recognising these struggles is going to involve understanding um, the very many different ways in which this can kind of manifest. So this can range from difficulty with task completion to challenges in managing emotions or time. And a key thing to understand is this can be very frustrating for everyone involved because a child struggles with things like task planning, organisation, task execution can get directly in the way of them demonstrating their learning and understanding which might be sound and this can lead to this like cycle of disengagement or anxiety as the child and the adults around them can become increasingly frustrated as the child's inability to do what is expected of them and demonstrate learning on a topic in a way that's outlined might be poor even though they've understood, engaged with, and maybe been really interested or excited by the topic. So sometimes executive functioning skills get directly in the way of this um, execution, doing the task, showing the learning. Sometimes executive functioning skills will get in the way of the original understanding too. So they can impact every single step of the educational journey from the basics of just turning up in class at the right time with the right equipment to having the skills to perform well in terms of taking on board or regurgitating in an appropriate way the learning so they may not for example perform well in an exam even if they've understood well the concepts behind the exam. So for a moment before we dive into executive functioning skills and how we support them I I just think it's really important a little bit of a soapbox moment that we explore neuronormative assumptions what are neuronormative assumptions that's a big fancy word and I hate big fancy words neuronormative assumptions is kind of like assumptions that we have as a society about what normal is and should look like and neuronormative assumptions are when we make assumptions about neurology and how people should function function. So today, for today's context, this is the assumption that it's normal and should be appropriate for everyone to aim to function in the kind of way that we are expecting of our children. When we say there's dysfunction in their executive functioning um, because they are not able to plan, organise, sit through an exam, etc., then I guess what I'm questioning is, is it okay for us to make those assumptions that this way of functioning is the only and predominant way that everyone should aim for? So when we delve into that world of neuronormal, assumptions it invites us to question this kind of 
tightrope that we sometimes ask our children to walk in the academic circus. So think about it. There's this invisible tightrope that we've set right? Expecting all children to perform to the same high wire act of executive functioning skills. But the reality is that some kids are going to glide effortlessly across, whilst others might like really, really wobble or just pick a different path entirely. It's kind of like asking everyone to ride the same unicycle when they're born or to juggle or to perform acrobatics. The challenge here is to just for a moment, just pause and reflect on whether these assumptions really align with the diverse strengths and talents that our children possess. And I think you might be able to gauge from my tone which side I kind of sit on here. So the healthy challenge here, like consider a day without that metaphorical tightrope where children have to perform in this certain way that we expect of them. How might we create an academic environment that allows for those different skills to shine? The kids that might take the other path might be wobbly on the tightrope, but amazing at juggling with fire. I don't know. Challenge yourself to spot and celebrate the unconventional talents in your students and children, the ones that may not fit the traditional kind of hoop jumping mold, but um, should be enabled to showcase their unique abilities. However, we need to be realistic. And despite my ideologies and my willingness to stand on the soapbox and say that every child needs to be able to function in the way that works best for them, I think it's important that we face the reality of school um, and the need for our children to develop executive functioning skills in the neuronormative sense. So schools with their bustling classrooms and buzzing hallways often operate like grand circuses with various acts. Here, the unspoken expectation is that Every child should master the same tricks, balancing an array of executive functioning skills to perfection. However, we must recognise that while some students may be acing the hoop jumping routine, others could be backflipping alternative approaches. The challenge lies in acknowledging the diversity of skills our children possess, understanding that not everyone thrives under the same big top and create an environment that celebrates um, the multitude of talents. And, and, and this is great to a certain extent. So a healthy challenge here for, for educators in particular, but picture the school day as this circus tent filled with diverse acts. Challenge yourself to identify and appreciate the unique talents every child brings into the ring. How could you, as the educator, adjust the spotlight to showcase their individual strengths, making the circus of learning, I'm going to keep going there with this analogy, I like it, a more inclusive and enjoyable spectacle for everyone. But the additional challenge here is that's great. Yeah, maybe you're a primary school teacher and we go, yeah, we all learn in different ways. That's amazing. Fantastic. When they're little, lovely, brilliant. But there's an additional challenge that in school, our children are basically all working towards the same end goal, right? Passing a bunch of exams to prove themselves. And whether or not we agree um, with that measure as an end goal it is the end goal that 99% of our children are working towards. So no matter how well we might be able to enable each child to shine in a way that works for them day to day, we do kind of need to be able to help them to develop enough of the right, in inverted commas for those who are just listening, air quotes, I hate air quotes, the right kind of skills to help them succeed according to society's expectations. I do say this, though, just a little caveat, parenthesis, imagine the parenthesis. I say this all very conscious of the fact that I've actually withdrawn my own children from school and fear I might be going a little bit kind of native. So I might be a bit ranty. Um, apologies about that. I'm starting to develop some fairly strong feelings on the topic. Um, but I hope at least this provides just like a little bit of food for thought. So the, the, the kind of TLDR is this executive functioning stuff. Kids function in different ways. They are each brilliant. If we can find a way for them to shine, find a way for those skills to come to the fore. However, in order to do school well and pass and have what they need to do next to do well in society, we basically require this specific set of neuronormative executive functioning skills. So the next bit of this podcast is all about me going, OK, well, yeah, despite the fact that every child is different and we should celebrate and enable that, actually, here's how to make them all be able to do the same things. And I sort of hate myself a little bit for doing this. But I get asked about it a lot. And as an autistic individual living within society, I have learned that knowing how to apply these skills well has been somewhat important in order to get through life well. So 
What does this look like? What strategies can we use to support the neuronormative executive functioning of children at school? So I'm going to share like eight ideas with you for the classroom. Then we're going to think about uh, home in a moment. Um, some of these ideas will resonate and you'll think that you could use them well. Just cherry pick what's good. The ones that you don't like, bank them for later or just ignore them, whatever. But I think it's good to hear a range of ideas because then you can pick the ones that chime. Different things chime for different people. Okay, so first of all, number one, narrative directions. So here we're going to integrate verbal instructions with narrative. So you're going to basically think aloud as you model thought processes. You're allowing the child to hear the thought process that's happening in your head by verbalizing it and break down multi-step directions, making them more tangible for your neurodivergent learners. So basically break it all down, say it out loud. This kind of practice of narrative directions is not only going to clarify expectations, but it's also going to reinforce that important skill of organising information in an appropriate way for it to be acted upon. Number two, graphic organisers galore. So provide a variety of graphic organisers and tools for organising and synthesising information. So model their usage, use them alongside and with the child um, in real tasks, allowing your neurodivergent learners to grasp the concept of actually organising that information effectively. These organisers can be shared in hard copy um, or digitally for ease of accessibility. Number three is about media rich learning. I love a bit of media rich learning. So harnessing the power of technology and multimedia, make the use of the fact that we're living in this wonderful time with so many ways to do different things. Um, you can use this to showcase visual exemplars of organizing information, planning tasks and setting goals. So use that multimedia to allow you to demonstrate. Show real life examples like unique text annotations or creative maths problem solving using media images and video resources. So essentially take the things that work for you or examples that you've seen that work elsewhere and demonstrate them, show them, share them with the child through a range of different media so they can take on board these ideas that you're trying to communicate with them. Sometimes the ideas are sound and we just need to find different ways of communicating them with the child. And really helpful if they can take away those ideas as well. So like if there's a video, are they able to watch that video again in their own time if they need to? Number four is app-based assistance. So using apps for managing lists, um, timers, generating reminders, setting goals and organizing information. There's so many apps out there, so many really brilliant ones. Um, so share these apps with parents and students, get them to share them back, share them amongst peers, find out what's working um, and ensure that students and families are aware of the supportive tools and that they've got permission and the capacity to use them day to day. These tools are going to be crucial if these kids are going to manage manage in life. It's not just about managing in school. So sometimes we got to remove some of the barriers to our children being allowed to use these various devices and apps within school so that they can use this kind of assistive technology, really, that's a form of that in order to support and help them. These are things that many adults will make use of in their day to day life and learning to use them from a young age to support and enable us to thrive and engage day to day and just do a little bit better, manage things a bit more well is a really appropriate and healthy thing to do, I believe. Number five is about using memory games and chunking to help improve working memory. So working memory talks about how many things we can hold in our memory right now. So it's kind of about our short term memory. And for those of us with executive functioning skills, this can be very poor. I remember once having my uh, working memory measured when I was being tested for dyslexia. I was 19 and I just failed spectacularly at Oxford, uh, completely not got through the very first hoop at Oxford and my very kind tutor who had handpicked me and given me a space there decided that this couldn't possibly be because I was rubbish. There must be another reason. And indeed, she discovered that I was dyslexic and had fallen off a cliff edge here, which was great. So I got tested for working memory. And at this time, which will have been a combination of general burnout, overwhelm, I was anorexic at the time, my working memory was four. So what this meant was I could hold, um, for example, four numbers in my brain at any one time and accurately repeat them. So if somebody gave you a string of numbers, how many of them could you hold in your head if they were unrelated pieces of information? Or a shopping list, how many of those things could you hold in your brain? I think my working memory has perhaps improved some. I think I could do more than four. Maybe I should test it again now. I'm, I'm intrigued. It's not greatly more than four though. And for anyone who's neurotypical, four probably sounds like a really small number. If someone gave you their phone number, how much of it would you recall, for example? 
Four's not a lot, not a lot of things to hold in your mind. And some of our children will have a smaller working memory than that and, and may just generally struggle with this. So memory games and chunking will improve this. There are things that we can do to improve um, the amount that we can manage in that sort of short term memory. So engaging our neurodivergent learners in memory games to enhance working memory just helps. It's, it's a skill, it's a muscle we can kind of develop and get better at. We can break down information into smaller, more manageable parts. We can use visuals to support some of us a better. Um, at remembering information when we're able kind of to, to picture it. Um, so seeing in the images rather than just hearing the names, which uh, can feel a little bit hard, less tangible, um, and creating checklists for tasks. So these, these kinds of activities can aid in strengthening those memory skills. We need to work on it, make it better. Um, this is really crucial for daily tasks. Um, the other thing we can do is try to kind of associate things, and, and we can try and do that in a kind of a, a playful way or the way in which my might say or present things. So for example, if you're going to give someone um, a list of letters to remember, then just a list of random letters is really difficult to remember. But if we're able to bring them together into chunks of little things that kind of make sense to them, then this can be easier to remember. So one of the things I find really hard, I get asked for my car number plate all the time because I'm always checking into hotels. I just can't remember it. One of the things I do is just have it written on my phone. Like it's literally like written in Sharpie on the phone case so that I can quickly look at it but I always remember the end of my car number plate because instead of it being three random letters there's ZZY and I think of my car as being snazzy and that's like the end of the word snazzy so ZZY I can remember so it's just the beginning bit that I really struggle with but if they were three random letters it would be much much harder if it was P F N then unless I made it stand for something then I might remember it but there are games basically working memory is something we struggle with turn it into games practice it think about chunking just recognize that it's something we're going to find harder and, and do things to help us practice that have fun with it um, and make it a little bit easier uh, number six is around organization techniques Organisation, a challenge for many a neurodivergent child or young person and indeed adults. This is one we have fun with in our house here um, with two autistic children. So developing a structured and organised classroom environment can really help here. Um, having things, you know, everything having its place and a place for everything. Utilising labelled areas and visuals to support these kinds of tasks can help. You might colour code materials, use visual schedules and just consistently teach and model these kind of organisational skills, encouraging children to approach things in an organised way, understand the benefits of this um, and how it can support us in having the right things at the right time and so on and so forth, ensuring that everything yeah, is, is, is orderly. Um, this has multiple benefits because it helps to teach these important skills of organisation, but it also um, will create an environment that feels more accessible, more calm, more ordered um, for children and young people who may require that kind of calmer and more structured space in order to remain sensorily regulated. Number seven, attention boosting strategies. So you might tailor instruction to incorporate favorite topics. So a child who finds it hard to pay attention, to get engaged, if you're able to tap into like their special interests, then you are more likely to be able to maintain their attention. And if you can do this, you won't need to necessarily do this forever, but um, learning to pay attention for longer, learning to concentrate, building up those skills, that capacity is gonna be really, really important. So if we can bring in their favorite topic in order to be able to do that, all's the better or involve a member of staff with whom they engage particularly well while we practice that again paying attention I find this hard to think now because I can work for hours so my working time we find ourselves now about half past five in the morning I'm recording this I work between the hours of four and seven this is my my time and I work really long stretches very very focused because I go into hyper focus mode because I've created the optimal zone so that's you know works for me but I did not used to be able to do this so the same Professor Mellonby she was amazing she's no longer alive sadly but then I think she was about 802 when I was at university but Professor Mellonby the same one who rescued me when I fell off that dyslexia cliff edge and got my dyslexia diagnosis and significant support I'd not received before um, she also uh, helped me with my attention skills so she um, recognized in our tutorials I think my complete inability to pay attention for 
any period of time. And she estimated this. So she was very interested in these sorts of things. She was quite a pioneer in her field and did lots of kind of educational psychology. But she was interested in this because she felt I was quite brilliant, but not good at all the things. Um, and she measured it she without really telling me she was doing this like how long I could actually stay on task for pay attention for in tutorials and she reckoned this was after a couple of tutorials of doing this um uh, uh just just over four minutes <laughs> which again that doesn't sit with my current experience of self which shows these things can improve so she created a plan with me at the age of like 19 I was not not a small child about how to improve my ability to pay attention and it was, you know, essentially her plan was quite a simple one was which topics are we really interested in here? Let's go learn about them. Let's actually set a timer for you. See if you can stay on task and let's just gradually increase our timer. It really wasn't rocket science. But the key thing here was identifying, hey, here's the thing that you really do appear to struggle with. Is this a thing you'd like to improve? I think it's a thing we'd both like you to improve. Let's create a simple plan for trying to do that and actually call that skill or lack of out and work on it. And indeed, it, it worked incredibly well. So um, we can do other things as well to, to, to boost individuals' attention. So as well as using things that they're interested in, we might use like flexible seating options um, for sensory feedback and to limit distractions. Or we might use timers. So we're going to pay attention for three minutes and then we're going to have a break for one um, or, or whatever works for the individual child. Um, or transition cues. So the other thing here is is transition between activities so we might go the other way and like really have like hyper focus and hyper attention in an area and then we're going to have to move to another task because it's school and we're always moving between tasks and I've mentioned so many times this is a thing that people who are neurodivergent tend to struggle with moving between tasks so transition cues knowing this bit of the learning is coming to an end we're going to move into a different bit of the learning soon and knowing how long that's going to be and maybe having something to support particularly if it's a change in mood or feel from lively and active and exciting to calm and focused for example we might need some music um, or something to help us to transition so we can also just teach and model active attention strategies um, and create an environment that's conducive to focused learning so this is this oh this one is one that really gets to me when we say well this child can't seem to pay attention at all they can't focus for more than two minutes on their work and I walk into the classroom and I'm like but they are basically trying to do this in a circus there's so much noise going on listen to that radiator that's rumbling away there and can't you smell the lunch that's coming in and there are eight different conversations happening of which this child is able to tune into all of them which means that they can't hear their internal narrative very clearly and you've given them a pencil that feels horrible in their hand and look at that chair there sitting there's just so much going on and we just think well why would this child be able to sit and concentrate if you needed to sit and concentrate for some time like you I don't know you had an important report to write or something really mattered to you or, or I don't know even just like you're, you're maybe you're a person who journals imagine you're a person who journals even if you're not, it's a very useful thing to be doing I'm just really getting into my journaling at the moment so if you wanted to journal you wanted a little bit of space to really focus would you put yourself in a similar environment than we would put a child in a typical UK classroom in order to journal? Would you sit on a very uncomfortable... What? Chairs. The chairs in classrooms are so uncomfortable. Why is this? So would you sit yourself on a little plastic creaky chair at a table that's maybe not quite the right height? Because does anyone really think about this stuff? I know some of you do, by the way. This isn't critical of all of you. But just generally, people don't think about this stuff. So creaky chair, table that might not be quite the right level. Having already sat there for hours, having heard many, many other things already with all the various different distractions going on. It's probably a bit cold and there's a draft coming at you and loads of other people. Talk. You just wouldn't. You're probably going to find a little cosy nook somewhere or sit at your desk, which is set up exactly you want might put a little bit of music on in the background might have a little cup of tea I've always got one to hand a bit of red bush going on here just to help with the thinking help with the flow there are loads of little things you would do I think if you wanted to be really focused and bring your best self and pay attention to a task that we don't necessarily provide for our children when we expect them to pay attention. So yeah, there are loads of attention boosting strategies, things that we can do to help a child to increase their ability to pay attention, but don't forget about the environment, creating the environment or even just a little nook within our environment where it's possible to deploy those skills matters too. Just getting back off my soapbox now, I've been a bit ranty today. Sorry, sorry about that. 
Um, okay, and then finally, number eight, I said there were going to be eight here before we go on to home. Empowerment through responsibility. And of course, some of these things can be used at, at home as, as well as at school. But so empowerment through responsibility. So gradually shifting responsibility from neurodivergent learners. So encouraging independence and managing um, their progress. So this is about not just doing things for and always us leading this learning in executive functioning skills, but gradually um, encouraging them to do more things actually for themselves because we need to develop these skills so they can use them beyond when we're there to support. So we can implement a three before me approach where students would seek assistance from three peers or resources before the teacher. This can be like really empowering, give the child a bit of a sense of ownership and self-efficacy. It's great as a small person when you begin to be able to do things for yourself. Okay, so Remember then, these strategies, these, these kind of eight we thought about for school, they're not only going to address the challenges, but they're also going to empower our neurodivergent learners in developing executive functioning skills um, so that they can use them not just in your classroom, but in many different parts of their life. OK, and then we're going to think a little bit about practical strategies for supporting at home. I know there's like a wide range of people who listen into the podcast. Thank you. I don't say thank you enough, actually. I, I really am grateful. I'm always amazed. Everywhere I go, people come up to me and talk to me about my podcast. And I just stand here in my office in the early hours of the morning um, talking to myself, really. And, I, and it, it, it blows my mind a little bit that there are actual people out there uh, listening to my ramblings and my rantings, even when I get on my soapbox. So, no, thank you. I do appreciate it. And when you have ideas for, for things you'd like me to talk about in future, do let me know. So we're thinking now practical strategies for supporting at home. So we're going to think about those executive functioning skills. They're not just for the classroom. We need them really in every aspect of our life. So these skills go beyond the school gates. Um, it's, a, it's a journey that's going to need to continue within the supportive walls of home. And home often is a, a real sort of safe refuge for children, particularly if they're struggling at school. So parents and caregivers understanding how to foster these skills in a really familiar environment is going to be really, really supportive in nurturing the child's holistic development. So this is something that we think about quite a lot in our home and we make a lot of use of things like routines, shared calendars, organising things around the home, although this is also a cause of constant conflict between me and my absolute need for order, she says, again, reflecting on the colour ordered books in the background. I got more criticism for that this week, but many people responded with love. Um, but yeah, I love order, um, but my kids who appreciate order and thrive on it, but they, I think, how would I say this charitably? They struggle to maintain it. Um, so this can cause a little conflict in our home. Anyway, so what practical ideas can you try at home? Um, you're probably already doing some of the ones I'm going to suggest, but it might be a reminder to re-engage with them or do them a bit more. Or there might be some new ones in here for you. But in, in these kinds of ideas, um, for what it's worth, do no harm to anyone at all. So whether neurodivergent or not, whether they struggle with executive functioning or not, these are just things that will will support and, and, and will be of a special support for children uh, and adults who might struggle with executive functioning. So. Welcome to how we do things in my house, basically. <laughs> structured routines, number one. So structured routines. So establishing consistent routines is going to provide a solid foundation for developing executive functioning skills, doing things in similar ways um, again and again. Just, just helps us, creates also an environment that feels less anxiety provoking and a bit more predictable. So a daily schedule that includes designated times for tasks like homework, if you have it, um, chores, if you have them, uh, leisure, actually blocking out leisure time, really important. Um, consistency is going to really help our new neurodivergent children um, anticipate and manage their time effectively so that's how it's going to help with this executive function stuff. Um, visual timelines so this is something we talk about at school a lot through like visual timetables and stuff but introducing visual timetables and, and, and timelines at home similar to those that you might use at school um, can be helpful you can display them like physically um, or using digital tools but a visual kind of roadmap of daily activities can really help some of our children and it can also really reinforce that that sort of concept of planning and organisation. So it helps with executive functioning, but also reduces anxiety um, again as well. So we used to do it sometimes as simply as um, we have a whiteboard and we'd have written on it, like just basic stuff like when is lunch happening and what are we having and what is, is happening today? Like who, you know, if there's a tutor coming in or we're going climbing or whatever, it would just be written up on the board. We're doing this a bit less now. We've got more into our groove and everyone's settled down a bit. We're all dysfunctioning a bit better. But certainly when we first went to home ed it'd be there like every day so everybody knew just exactly um what was going on and certainly we we still have this in like um like apps and, and shared
shared stuff. We all we all have access to what's happening each day, um, but we no longer need to have it like completely emblazoned on the wall. There'll be times again, I'm sure, in the future when this is helpful, particularly when things are busy. Um, but yeah, and with younger children as well, just having this 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 kind of roadmap, visual roadmap, can really help. Uh, number three, task checklists. So we can empower children um, by involving them in creating task checklists. So you probably won't for yourself, but maybe get the kids involved too. So breaking down daily activities into manageable steps, um, because then we get to tick them off. And everyone really loves to tick stuff off that's been completed. It's going to promote a sense of accomplishment. First thing on the to-do list, write to-do list done um, but also it's going to reinforce those organizational skills and and, and it's good role modeling with your children too and number four developing flexible workspaces so designating flexible workspaces at home and it sounds like when we talk about home in this way I, I appreciate your home is not a work environment it's your house it's your home you just want to enjoy yourselves there and talking about like flexible workspaces just feels a little bit I don't know cold but I do think sometimes trying to apply some of the things that we would use like in a, in a work in a school in a professional context and thinking about that in the home can help and it doesn't mean you've got to do anything fancy just knowing that oh that little nook there that my child likes to sit in that in my head becomes the designated workspace for X. Like we don't have to label it. We don't have to do fancy stuff with it. But just, just knowing, recognising which are the spaces that work and why and what can we do to, to promote that a little bit further and get them used at the right times. So yeah, having flexible workspaces at home that might cater to individual sensory needs. So it might be a cosy corner with cushions or a well-lit desk or having space conducive to focus um, and attention to enable the execution of tasks. So remembering when I was ranting earlier about how hard it is to concentrate in a classroom and how you might find a little nook for your journal writing where's the place that your child would naturally gravitate towards in order to be able to really function on what they're doing we can improve those skills over time and get better at functioning in a range of environments but at the beginning just finding what's optimal and doing it so here's a funny thing when my children first started educating at home and I think it's fair to say neither of them were in a great place I don't think Lyra or Ellie would mind that being shared and um, they were really struggling they they both really needed to be in very small spaces. So we've talked about this before. This is um, when we make our, uh, it's called containment. When we make our world smaller, it feels easier to manage. So particularly when anxiety is very high, this is why we pull our hoods up and we might seek these small spaces. So in order to feel safe academically, my children would find really tiny spaces. And we actually live in quite a big house, but they'd find like cupboards or nooks under stairs or inside things under things behind things and they would essentially hide themselves away in these tiny little corners little nooks and do their work there when they were able to engage with their work at all that was where it started much more flexible now they work in many different places um not judgy about whether they're at a desk or not but um they don't always have to be in a tiny little corner but yeah they used to fight over one particular cupboard big house one particular cupboard both children wanted to be in it and squished up and working um but yeah, where are, where are the workspaces that, that work for your child to do the things they want, whether that's academic endeavour or engaging in their favourite hobby? And, and what can we do to enhance those spaces to enable concentration and uh, attention being paid and enjoyment and engagement with whatever the task in hand is? Number five for families is collaborative planning. So actually involving our children in planning family activities. Um, this approach, like working together, is on not only going to like hone their planning skills, but it's going to provide opportunities for them to express their preferences and priorities. So we end up doing stuff that everybody enjoys a little bit more. Um, and the yeah, you're going to find these sessions together can be actually both like productive and enjoyable. So so plan together. Don't take it all on yourself. Do it do it together. And sometimes maybe even hand the reins over to the kids. That's always a little bit terrifying, but great for them and can result in some pretty interesting times if you're happy to kind of roll with it a bit put some parameters in place if you need to I always need to number six is mindful transitions so kids can struggle to move between activities at home just as they can at school so thinking about those transitions um, uh, so you might provide like verbal cues or you might use timers or music to help to flip the mood this is our favorite one at home we, we love to flip the mood with music so the exciting sing-along music in the car when we're on the way to climbing and we've been doing a morning of uh, intensive learning at home um, this can help uh, children learn how to like shift their attention between tasks um, and between sort of energy types. And this is skills that we can apply to our lives 
generally. Number seven is about emotional regulation techniques. So recognizing the importance as a parent, as a caregiver of emotional regulation in executive functioning. When our emotional regulation is poor, our ability to function generally is shot. Um, and so if we can teach and model techniques for managing emotions, things like deep breathing, um, mindfulness, creating sort of calm down spaces or working things off using physical activity, just, just role modeling this, showing it, allowing our children to learn these ways to emotionally regulate. That could be a whole other podcast if we want it on emotional regulation and ideas for school versus ideas for home. If anybody wants it, let me know and I will do it. Um, and then finally, number eight is inclusive family discussions. I come back to this kind of idea a lot and I always, I don't know how much it kind of resonates with people or feels like a realistic thing in your home, but I think we could and should be doing it a bit more. So Having open discussions within the family about executive functioning skills, sharing insights, celebrating achievements, however small, and discussing the challenges collectively. So creating this like inclusive dialogue is going to foster a supportive atmosphere in your home where children feel heard and understood, where we can explore challenges together and look to overcome problems together as well. And just in having these discussions, there's just so many benefits and it just feels like a thing that we don't do enough. When we can openly have these discussions, we can role model, we can show our children the things that we do, we can problem solve together, which makes us a team and builds connection and belonging within the family. It's just a really, really great thing to do. So so think about it. And again, you don't have to label it as, as you know, family meeting on executive functioning skills. This is about just when you're chatting anyway or, or something comes up that prompts it, just leaning into that, exploring it, getting curious and fostering this ability to be curious as a family and to be a little bit vulnerable and to then seek to solve those problems uh, and overcome those barriers a little bit together. So again, just just remembering on all that, the the home environment is going to play a really crucial role in shaping the executive functioning skills um, of our children. Um, So this is is going to support them, but it's also going to create uh, a, a space where these skills can just thrive naturally when we start thinking um, about these things. Okay, and then uh, I'm kind of aware how long this episode is getting. I've got a lot to say on this, but I don't think it's okay for me to finish this just having like listed all the ways to improve children's neuronormative executive functioning without actually just doing just a little bit on recognise and working with a child's strength. So we've been thinking about executive functioning skills, but we need to, to shift our focus sometimes from challenges to strength. So yeah, our neurodivergent kids and, and adults like me, we struggle to function in the way that society expects us to but we're really good at other things. If we can recognise and build upon the unique abilities of neurodivergent children and adults, then it's going to be a really powerful way to empower them on their kind of educational and life journey. So I have got a lot of ideas on this, but here's just a few to get you started because you have been listening for a long time already. So first of all, just like strength spotting exercises. This works at home, at school. So conduct a strength spotting exercise. So encouraging... Um, your, yourself, educators, parents, any just the people around a child to identify and celebrate each child's unique strengths. Just look for them, particularly those children where we're very good at listing their challenges. Just look for the strengths. What is this child really brilliant at? Next, interest-based learning. So incorporating the child's interest into learning activities is just going to naturally enhance their engagement and their motivation. So we'll often find there are really deep areas of passion and interest here um, and that this can be a great way to tap into a child's natural sort of aptitude, skills, ability to focus and so on. Number three is personalised goal setting. So collaboratively setting personalised goals with neurodivergent children. So ensuring the objectives align with their individual strengths. So loads of our goals with neurodivergent children are around enabling them to become a bit more like neurotypical and perform in a more neurotypical way. But if instead we went, well, okay, instead of taking the things that you're quote unquote bad at, let's have a look at the things that you really shine at and let's get even better at those things. Let's get really, really strong at that. So I noticed that, I don't know, you were really enjoying art yesterday and you hyper-focused on that for 40 minutes. Let's take that and build on that and see what our next goal with that might be. How can we be brilliant and really shine here? Um, Number four, peer mentoring. So facilitating peer mentoring programs where neurodivergent students might share um, their strengths and skills with their peers. So where we notice strengths in a student, take that, celebrate it, use that and and enable them to support their peers as well. Give them the responsibility of sharing those wonderful passions, interests and skills. Um, Number five is about creative expression outlets. 
So providing opportunities for creative expression, so not just all the kind of traditional ways of um, showing our learning and demonstrating our skills and our passions, um, but using more art, music, drama, different ways. Let's get imaginative. Um, take a step back in time uh, before Michael Gove and remember how we used to express ourselves. Yeah, remember those days? Um, and um, number six is about a strength inclusive learning environment. So fostering learning environments purposefully, proactively fostering learning environments that intentionally celebrate and integrate diverse strengths. So this means things like designing classroom activities and assessments that are going to allow neurodivergent students to demonstrate their understanding and skills in ways that align with their strengths. I just realized to say this, this, this is a really massive thing to say. And you're probably going, well, how do I do that, Pookie? I actually, I would love, I would love to do an episode exploring neurodivergent executive functioning, what that looks like, the strengths that we see there um, and um, how we can play to those strengths. So if that is of interest, if you got this far with your listening, drop me a line, talk to me on all the socials or drop me an email or drop me a message on Patreon. And if you want me to, to record that episode, let me know the, the questions you have the things you would want to know and I'll do it I'll get thinking about it I would I would love to record an episode on that if there is interest in it and um, it'd be, 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 be a big one to put together because there's just I just don't think it's a thing we do really well but we could do better so we can we can work on that together we're nearly there, guys. In today's exploration of executive functioning skills, we have journeyed through the intricate landscape of understanding and supporting neurodivergent children from unraveling the mysteries of what executive functioning skills entail to challenging neuronormative assumptions a little bit, and celebrating the unique strengths of every child. It's been quite the ride. I did warn you. Um, I hope that there were some helpful ideas in here for you. If you liked what you heard today, then please like, subscribe and share my work. You can support me further um, by joining me over on Patreon, where you'll get access to my resources early and the chance to influence what I work on next. Or you can invite me to speak at your next event um, or in your setting. Or, and I can do this either virtually or face to face. Thank you so much for listening this week and every week um, and for everything that you are doing for the children and young people in your care. This has been Pookie Ponders with me, Pookie Knightsmith. Until next time, stay curious, stay compassionate and keep pondering. Over and out. Mm -hmm.